I invite you to take God's word and open to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading in the 16th verse. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outward man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, your inerrant, infallible, life-giving word. Now help us understand and apply it, write the truth of it on our hearts. For this, we really need you. We need the Holy Spirit come and help. Illumine the word of God to us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 16 is where we start. It says, therefore, Paul writing, we do not lose heart, but our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man, our inner man, is being renewed day by day. Do you see the first words? Therefore, we do not lose heart. To lose heart is to lose hope. We can live for quite some time without food, less time without water, but less than a day without hope. Hope is, according to Hebrews 6, the anchor of the soul. Remember the scripture in 1 Corinthians that says, But now faith, hope, love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I think in our modern day, the most neglected of these three is hope. We hear a lot of messages about faith, a lot of messages about love, rightly so. But less is the case that we hear about hope, and we need it. It is an anchor for the soul. The function of an anchor is to keep a boat or a ship secure, and without it, it drifts away from the harbor. And so that analogy is given that hope is the anchor that keeps us in the harbor of God, in the safe place when there's storms around. Hope anchors us. And for hope, we need to know and believe the promises of God. And Paul writes, we do not lose heart. It goes on, but though our outward man is decaying, if you were to go to space, you would need a space suit to survive in space. You need a working space suit. On earth, to survive on earth, you need a working earth suit. And our bodies are earth suits. They are in the process of being destroyed. That's literally what we read here. It's decaying in the New American Standard, but it's a stronger word in the original. It means something that will eventually be destroyed. It's in process, but the end is certain, destruction. And our bodies are exactly that. We've received redemption from the Lord, but not, not yet the redemption of our bodies. That awaits the second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Christ is our hope. It's not a flimsy hope. Sometimes when people think of hope, they think it may happen, it may not. We hope for this. We hope for good weather at the wedding. We hope for this. We hope for that. But when the Bible speaks of hope, it speaks of a sure certainty regarding future events. And the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and that is the Christian's hope. Hope needs to be the anchor of our souls. We're in the process in our bodies of being destroyed. And yet, it goes on to say, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. I want to focus in on that for just a moment because the New Testament does not teach a one-time experience of come forward in the meeting, be prayed for, and then you'll receive something that will be good for the rest of the Christian life. You'll get the big dollop, the big dab of the Holy Spirit in such a way that you'll, you will just fly in the things of God. You will fly like eagles in the storms, above the storms, because of this experience. Now, the Bible says that 
We're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ at the moment of conversion. Everyone has received the Holy Spirit and we are to be continually filled with Him, the person of the Holy Spirit. And we are renewed not by a one-time experience or a second blessing, as some people refer to it, but day by day. That's how we're renewed. God has not put everything in the Christian life into the one-time experience and that's it. No, we are to be renewed day by day. Our bodies are in constant need of nourishment, constant need of daily renewal. Sleep is very precious to us, and the longer we live, the more precious it becomes to us. To get six to eight hours of sleep is often a goal of someone beyond a certain age. So sleep is very, very precious. But if you think about it, It's a message right there from God to man that you are not independent. You cannot function all by yourself. You are dependent on God for his air, for his nourishment, for life itself. In him we live and move and have our being. And every day, even if someone were to stay up 36, 48 hours, eventually they're going to come to the place when they cannot function anymore And even if they're standing on their feet, they're liable to go to sleep. It's a definite possibility. We need sleep. And there's a message in that. And if you were to get eight hours of sleep on average, think about that. That means a third of your day has been spent asleep. And you think through the ramifications of that mathematically. And a 60-year-old if he or she has been sleeping for eight hours every day, has been asleep for 20 years of their life. Like, what happened? I've been asleep for 20 years. And so it is. Our bodies are in constant need of refreshment and and of renewal. And in a similar way, the Bible here describes the inner man as needing and then getting from God renewal day by day. You're Inner man needs daily renewal. Think about that. How do we get that? That's what I want to understand. All of this is by design. God is teaching us through our bodies that we are dependent creatures. God neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's not like us in that sense. He's always awake. He's never needed to rest. Even though on the seventh day, the Bible says God rested from all his works. It wasn't because he was tired. He's never been tired. But we get tired, and Jesus as a man got tired and needed sleep. And so it is. He slept on the boat in the middle of a storm. Do you remember that? That was supernatural sleep. But he slept. As a man, he sleeps. But as God, never. And God never slumbers nor sleeps. But what's true for the outward man is true for the inward man. It needs renewal day by day. Matthew 6, we read these words, verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Hear this. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's daily trouble. Every day, according to Jesus, has its trouble. You may set your schedule so that you can eliminate eliminate all trouble, but very rarely works. Something happens that causes trouble. But in the middle of the daily trouble that Jesus said we would have, there's daily mercy. Hear these words from Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 22. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Some of you may may remember it in a song because another version reads this way, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So think about that. There's daily trouble and there's daily mercy poured out upon us. This phrase, being renewed, if you look in your uh, text there, verse 16, Uh, Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. It's a phrase also found in Colossians 3. The 10th verse reads, And you've put on the new self, which is, hear that phrase again, being renewed in knowledge 
after the image of its creator. That's the ESV right there. Being renewed in knowledge. I think that's a key for renewal in the Christian life, to have knowledge of something. Paul wants us to get it. Oftentimes you read this phrase, I would not have you ignorant. And he does not want us to, not, to, to be unaware of what God is doing and how he does it. Being renewed in knowledge. Let me say to you, the condition of your and my heart has a lot to do with what you and I know. It's impacted by knowledge, by content, by information in your head. What you think matters. And it matters when it comes to hope. When someone is hopeless, they have been thinking a certain way. When someone's hopeful, they've been thinking a certain way. And the Christian who is an informed Christian has hope. There is such a thing as doctrinal deadness, as people who are dead from the neck down, so to speak. And what do we do with that? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1, knowledge puffs up. But that's not an objection to, uh, to, to the fact that we need knowledge. We do need it, but it has a tendency to puff us up with all that we know. One of the things that I find helpful is to realize that I don't even know what infinite looks like, what it, what it even is. I've not even got an awareness of what infinite knowledge is. It's so vast. And God is infinite in his knowledge. We are but finite creatures. And therefore, we don't even know how ignorant we are. We have no idea. We can't grasp what infinity looks like in the realm of space, in the realm of time, in the realm of knowledge. So we don't know how ignorant we are. And we're to grow in knowledge. That's a biblical command. Grow in the knowledge of the grace of of God found in Christ. What do you think matters? There's such a thing I know of doctrinal deadness, yet we're told to grow in the knowledge of God. What we need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to apply the knowledge we know so that it comes out of a living relationship with God, so that we're prayerful in our study, we're prayerful in our uh, reading of the Word, so that God might write the truths on our hearts. Knowledge by itself is not a sufficient cause of renewal because you can be dead with knowledge. But it's a necessary factor. For you and I to be renewed, we need to be renewed in knowledge. When the Holy Spirit applies the truth of God to us, we are renewed day by day. Not by having a one-time experience or a one-time Bible study, a one-time read of a verse, but an ongoing daily intake of the Word of God. Let's go to verse 17. For, and notice that word there, for momentary light affliction is producing for us, what does it say? An eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And Paul writes, momentary, light, affliction. You can often ask the question, does he have a right to say that? Does he actually know what I'm going through? Well, when we understand what he went through, we have uh, much more of an idea of how much weight he has in being able to say and write what he does. Does he have a right to say this? Well, of course he has as the Lord's apostle. But secondly, This man endured much. Let me read something to you. It's Luke who records this for us in Acts chapter 9. You can turn there if you wish, where we're seeing an unveiling of Paul's conversion experience. This is Luke writing, but he's writing about Paul being converted. Acts 9 verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he's seen a vision. 
seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Did he suffer? His trials were anything but temporary. As you read through the book of Acts, you see that they were constant. When he was going to go into a town or a city, he didn't need to look up the greatest and best hotel. He knew that he's probably going to spend the night, if he lived, in a prison somewhere. He was constantly under pressure. These are Paul's own words later in 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 4. Perhaps you'll turn to chapter 11, verse 23. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I'm also in far more labors, in far more imprisonments. That's plural. Beaten times without number. He couldn't even remember how many times he was beaten. Often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's a whole story right there. You don't want to have the beating with rods in the ancient world. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and night I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys. He's mentioned danger already in verse 23. Now he mentions danger eight more times. Danger, danger, danger. Here we go. In dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers amongst false false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. And yet, we're reading these words in the context of Paul writing verse 17 of chapter 4, for momentary light affliction. (laughs) Uh, Earlier in this 2 Corinthians book, which is a book about suffering, and it's a book about glory, One of the reasons many people avoid preaching through it. It's not going to entertain the goats, that's for sure. But it'll bring comfort to all of us when we go through trials. 2 Corinthians 1, look with me in verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia. That's a different Asia from modern day Asia, which is a vast terrain. That we were burdened excessively, beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Some people say God will never give you something you can't handle. Yes, yes, he will. He'll not give you a temptation that is beyond you by the grace of God, but he often puts us in situations that we cannot handle. They're overwhelming, beyond our strength. So that, there are two so that's I want you to see. So that, We despaired even of life. Really? You're a Christian. Yep. I I didn't think I'm going to live. Really? Yep. Indeed, he says, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that, here's the second so that, we would not trust in ourselves. It's so overwhelming. We don't think we're going to live. We had the sentence of death upon us. And God says it's for a purpose. So that you're not going to trust In yourself, but what did it say? But in God who raises the dead. That's us as Christians. We're not to trust in our resources. When you say to yourself, I don't think how I'm going to get through this, God says, that's right where I want you at this moment so that your trust is not in you, but in me, the one who raises the dead. Who delivered us from so great a peril of death? and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our, see that word, hope, and he will yet deliver us. 
what he went through was too much for him, beyond his strength. You might be feeling right now that what you are going through, what we corporately are going through is beyond us. It's more than we can handle. And God says, yes, it is. So that we would despair of life. That's the first so that in this passage. And number two, that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. We're right where he wants us. I would suggest that there are very few Christians on earth who suffered as much as Paul. And yet, he writes in verse 17 of chapter 4 here, of light and momentary affliction. He could say, all of this is just, hey, it's lightweight stuff. How could he say that? We've listed, he's listed, uh, the many trials he's gone through, yet he classified it under the category of momentary light affliction. He saw it that way. He wants us to see it that way because he speaks not of his, but of our. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For momentary light affliction is producing for us, not just for him, us. It's a corporate thing. And all that we go through needs to be classified under the heading, under the classification of momentary light affliction. How could he say that? I believe the answer is what he's unveiling in this passage because he grasped the realities of the eternal. That's why. And he wants us to grasp that too. In the light of eternity, all that we go through here is temporal and light in comparison. Now that's not to be flippant about suffering. Paul wasn't. But it's to put suffering in its rightful place in our heads. Because it's in the head that we fight for hope. Hope is a helmet. Hope is an anchor. And we need a biblical concept regarding suffering. Suffering and glory are in this passage and in 2 Corinthians over and over again, but it's also in Romans. It's the same author, Romans 8. Let me just read to you verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption of sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs, with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Suffering and glory are inseparably linked. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I believe Romans 8 18 is a parallel verse to the verse we're reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What we're going through in this world, this present time, is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Through his tears, through his suffering, he never lost sight of glory. And the only way you and I are going to view suffering rightly is in the light of eternity. Anything else will give you a false perspective. You can look and see the righteous and you see what they go through. And yet, someone who's lived all their life trapped in a wheelchair, the moment they see Jesus face to face, it's going to see like a light affliction because of the glory revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. We need that perspective. We need it right now, and we need it always. Verse 17 again, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. See the link now with verse 18 of Romans 8. The Greek here is hyperbole, from which we get the English word hyperbole. And it means out of all proportion. It exceeds all limitation. 
Far beyond all comparison is what we read in verse 17. It exceeds all limitation. It's impossible, in other words, for this to be an overstatement. It's impossible for this to be an exaggeration. No, this is real. What we go through here has no comparison whatsoever. What is the weight of glory in the eternal realm is far beyond all comparison with the momentary, the light, affliction. Notice the contrast in this text, the word momentary, contrasted with the word eternal. Notice the word light, contrasted with the word weight. Something's light, lightweight, and then weight, weighty. What a, what a difference, what a comparison, what a contrast. Notice the difference between affliction and glory, a glory far beyond all comparison. Notice too, it does not say, and here's what's really interesting, the momentary light affliction will one day become something of worth. No, it says is producing. Is that what your Bible says? Is producing. It doesn't say one day your suffering will be worthwhile. It's saying right now your suffering is worth something. It is producing. Present tense. It's worth something now. It is producing. It's doing something now. Your suffering is doing something right now. Ladies and gentlemen, your suffering is a factory where a weighty, eternal product is being produced. That which is temporary, that which is light, your daily trouble produces an eternal weight of glory. The only way you and I are going to understand suffering correctly is in the light of eternity. Anything else will give you a false perspective. Let me invite you to take your earthly glasses off and look through the lens of the new glasses God wants you to wear as you go through the trials of your life, the eternal glasses God has given you by His Word. Let's go to verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. This is amazing. Paul is writing, what I'm talking about, you can't see any of it. Not with your earthly eyes, not with earthly eyesight. You can't see anything of this except by the eye of faith. This, in fact, is the context for the next chapter. Let's just read chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, that's our earth suit, which is our house, is torn down, it packs in, doesn't work anymore. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, a resurrection body, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, he refers to the physical body as the tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. We long for the eternal. We long for the promises of God to be fully realized. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. While we're in our earth suit, we're not before the Lord. We're not with the Lord. We're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And so it goes on. Christian, get this. You ought to look at something. Verse 18 of chapter 4. While we look, not at things which are seen. 
Some of you want to just say, well, I, I can't understand that. I can't see it. That's right. And I'm supposed to look at it? How do I do that? How do I look at something I can't see? Would you look at that? Would you, would you look at that? What? I can't see it. You cannot see it in the realm of the senses, the five senses. We walk by faith, not by sight. This is not something that God is going to show us by means of apparitions and visions. It's only by the eye of faith. He's not going to take us up to heaven normally. That's not what he does. He tells us how things are by means of the word of God. And that's how we're to walk. And Paul wants us to grasp hold of that thing that is helping him as he goes through the suffering of this world. It's light. It's momentary affliction. Praise the Lord. You can't see it, but look at it. Focus on it. Focus on it. Focus on what you can't see. What am I supposed to focus on? That glory is being produced right now. Glory is being produced. On what basis can Paul say this? Well, he explains, for the things which are seen are temporal. The Greek word here for temporal is proskairos. It means destined to perish. It's something that will not last. It's transient. Everything you and I can see is subject to change. Oh no, uh, mountains, they're not, uh, they're, they're not subject to change. Oh, you can blow up mountains. Everything you can see is subject to change. But that which is eternal is un changing, will never change. The things which are seen are temporal. They're like airline schedules. You're scheduled to leave at 2.48, but that doesn't mean you will. And the things that you can see are subject to change. They're not eternal. Jesus said it this way, heaven and earth, that covers everything, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Word of God will outlast this world. It's an eternal Word given to us. Now that God has spoken it out, breathed it out, it'll be here forever and there forever. Wherever there and here is, that's where the Word will be. But the things which are not seen, do you see that in your text? The things which are not seen are eternal. The eternal is rock solid, will not be destroyed, will not crumble, will not decay, and lasts forever. So look at that. I wonder if you can go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and hear these words from verse 6. The same Apostle Paul writes, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. All those in government have temporary reign. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, Things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Don't stop there. Verse 10 says, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. How does he do that? By means of the Word of God. We do know something about the eternal realm. We do know that God is true, and everything he's revealed is true, and he's revealed it to us so that our hope could be massive when we go through troubled times. What are we to think about? That which is unseen? How about the person of God? Do you know God? Have you come to know Him by means of His Word? Or do you just think there's something out there? I, I believe there's something out there. Or have you taken time to find out what God has revealed about Himself? We can all make up gods. It's something called idolatry. God never allows for it, even though the Constitution does. The Constitution of the United States gives us the legal right to be idolaters, to believe any silly thing we like. But God never says, I accept 
every idea about me. He's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity. This God, the one God in three persons, the second person of the Trinity, was born of a virgin, lived an absolutely sinless life, died an atoning death on the cross, and rose again from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father in the place of all authority in heaven and on earth. And that's where we're to fix our hope. Praise the Lord. We're to think of God. We're to think of souls. Paul writes this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, for the sake of the elect, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory. Hardship, eternal glory. Do you see that? He says, for this reason, I endure. This is the reason. God has an elect people. And me preaching and writing and testifying of the grace of God. Through that means, God will draw all his elect, no matter what I go through. And from prison, Paul was able, in his suffering, to write things we're still reading today. Hallelujah. Do not let the present struggle blind you to your own future as a Christian. Set your heart on eternal things. Paul writes this in Colossians 3, Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above. It's again a parallel passage, isn't it? Set your mind, get your thoughts on the eternal. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Glory keeps showing up in these passages, doesn't it? What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your talents? What are you doing with your treasure? Is it in the kingdom of God? It needs to be. If you're a Christian, that's where you and I are to be thinking of the eternal. When we get to heaven, we'll not be mourning over the fact of what we gave to ministries and the local church will not be saying, I wish I gave $10 less. <laughs> that will not crush your mind. <laughs> I say all this, and yet I've done you something of a disservice in this preaching. I must admit this. One of the keys to correct interpretation of the Bible is to watch for several key words, words like, so, words like, so then. Words like for and words like therefore. If you've got a kind Bible teacher, he will often rem remind you of the phrase that is so often coined. Whenever you find a therefore, find out what it's there for. We began in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. And if you remember, we quickly skipped over the first word, therefore. It says, therefore we do not lose heart. Therefore, when you see us there, therefore, find out what it's there for. The therefore is a linking word to the passage that goes before it. And the passage before it starts at verse 7. And what we're about to read is the reason why we are not to lose heart. Christian, wake up, read verse 7 with me. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Jars of clay, some translations read, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves, not from ourselves. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing. Verse 7 speaks of human weakness. God's treasure is in something that doesn't look that great. Earthen vessels, jars of clay, clay pots. We don't look dazzling on the outside. This speaks of human weakness. 
What's inside us is dazzling. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God Himself. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. There's nothing on the outward that would show us that. You know, God can do a lot with a little, it's been said. He can do everything with nothing. If we remember we're jars of clay, nothing too special in the scheme of things. God can use us. Why would a host pipe take credit for the beautiful pure water going through it? It's God who wants to work through us. And if we'll just see ourselves as clay pots, God can do a lot in and with and through and by the means of us yielding ourselves to God, especially at this time, loving our neighbor, reaching out to them, meeting needs, telling them about the eternal realities of which the Bible speaks. Verse 7, foot. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that, key words, for this purpose, in other words, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. When someone realize, re realizes the fact that what they have as a gift is a gift, they're not going to take credit for it. And God says, I can use that. Amen. God's power is not innate to us. It's not from ourselves. Child of God, listen to this and let the buts here rise up in your hearts. Look at verse 8. We are afflicted in every way. That's right. Suffering is all around us. That's right. But not crushed. Checking on people. How are you doing? I'm afflicted in every way. Well, how are you really doing? Well, I'm afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed. Are you confused? Yeah, that's what perplexed means. How are you doing? I'm really perplexed. It's okay to be perplexed. As long as you recognize that with God on your side, you're perplexed, but not despairing. Hear that word. I'm not despairing. I'm perplexed, I'm confused, I don't know what's happening, that's right, but I'm not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. If you haven't had enough persecution, let me tell you about some of my Facebook friends. I can introduce them to you, and you can be persecuted too. Anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, will suffer persecution. Oh, you've got a, a, a dislike on Facebook? We don't know what persecution is for the most part here in the West. Many of our brothers and sisters do, but they're persecuted, but they know this, they're not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I hope there's a, a, a resonation, a, 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 something rising up in you and says, yes, that's right. I, I, I may be going through some hard times, but there's something still rising up in me. I'm not in despair. I'm not crushed, I'm not forsaken, I'm not destroyed. That's right, remind yourself of that. Let hope arise because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead enables and empowers us to endure suffering and affliction in this world. Verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest, manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Your flesh may be beautiful right now. If that's the case, take pictures. It's decaying. It's mortal flesh. It's going to be destroyed. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, the same attitude of faith, the same grasping of trust in God at such times, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Shoot your biggest shot, devil. Shoot your biggest shot, government authorities. Shoot your biggest shot. You kill me. Jesus will raise me up. That's my hope. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading, oh, are you worried about that which is spreading? Or how about grace which is spreading? 
to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. God is about getting glory. And by the spreading of grace, he will achieve it. All to the glory of God. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 for just a moment as we wrap this up. Therefore, on the basis of all we've read in verses 7 through 15, therefore, Christian, we don't lose heart, right? Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inward man, our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction is right now, producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison, while we've got the right glasses on, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. With my eternally focused glasses, I can see into the spiritual realm what God has revealed in His Word, and it's it's exciting enough to get me through, because that's my hope, seeing Him face to face. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Ladies and gentlemen, this world is not our home. We're merely pilgrims here. And yet all this is invisible to the naked eye. We walk by faith, not by sight. But I would submit to you that this, this is the Christian life. Anything less is not worth believing. The things of this world, wealth, health, beautiful relationships, as wonderful as they are, they can fail. But if we'll trust in God and see the eternal, we can go through anything. Paul wrote in Philippians, I know how it is to be abased and I know how it is to abound. The highs and the lows of life, I can do it all through Christ who strengthens me. Christ in you is the hope of glory. How do we get in on this? By believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a holy God who made us in his image. Man is made in the image of God, owing him absolute surrender and obedience. And yet we've defied him with our thoughts, with our words, with our deeds, something called sin, which is grievous in the sight of God. And yet, because of his love, when he saw us in our sin, he sent the Lord Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, into the world. God so loved this world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's something worse than the perishing of the body, that is the perishing of the soul in a place called hell. And it was God in His love for us in sending His Son for us that we would believe in Him. God is holy. Man's a sinner. And Christ has been sent into the world and lived a sinless life and then on the cross died for sinners in our place as our substitute, the Lamb of God. He died for us. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And anyone who believes in him will have eternal life because he took the punishment you and I deserve. We deserve wrath, not glory. We deserve banishment, not acceptance. We deserve death, not life. We deserve curse, not blessing. We deserve our sins to be punished, but someone was punished for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel story. So in the middle of all our trials, fix your hope on the eternal. It outweighs, it far outweighs, it's beyond all comparison with the things of this world. Luther wrote in the hymn, Mighty fortress, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That's where our focus should be. That's where our hearts should be set upon. Our minds should be set upon. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word. Help us now to see what you see. 
by putting on the glasses of the word that tells us that which we go through here is not worth comparing with the glory yet to be revealed. And what we go through here is producing in us something far more valuable than gold or silver or the acclaims of men. Let us live instead for the glory of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.